We are live with Carolina Poets, Poetry Goes Viral. Welcome. Welcome to this reading series, Poetry Goes Viral. This is a monthly, a bi-monthly series hosted on the Carolina Poets Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. That's Carolina Poets. And we are here the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. I'm your host, Andrew Clark, and I'd like to thank my co-curator, Kimberly Sims Gibbs, who helps host this series. Each of our readings, we feature three poets with connections to the Carolinas or one of our neighbors, which means we host some of the most talented poets on the planet from two of the writing estates and its neighbors. We feature established poets and emerging voices. So tonight, we are fortunate to have three powerful voices. We will hear from Jay Senta White, R. Flowers Rivera, and we will finish with Mildred, Mildred Barria. So any of you out there who have curated series, I just have to say, sometimes it's touch and go trying to get readers to you know, agree with all the schedules. And I just have to say tonight, I knew it was gonna be a magical night because everybody I asked said yes. All of my first uh, folks I reached out to said yes. First choices. So we're really looking forward to the reading tonight. Please ask any questions you have for our poets in the comments below this broadcast. We'll have a short Q&A session at the end. So our first reader tonight is going to be Jacinta White. As a lover of all things creative, Jacinta merges her perspective as an artist, professional, and community advocate for change and healing. Jacinta has spent nearly 20 years facilitating workshops through her company, The Word Project. Founded to give voice to the individual and community spirit, The Word Project also publishes the international quarterly Snapdragon, a journal of art and healing. Jacinta's latest poetry collection, Resurrecting the Bones, born from a journey through African-American churches and cemeteries of the rural South, love that title, Resurrecting the Bones. It was published in September of 2019 by Press 53. Jacinta has also been the recipient of the Duke Energy Regional Artist Project Grant, the Arts Council, Council of Winston-Salem, Forsyth County, the Palm Beach County Poetry Festival Fellowship, and the 100W Corsicana Residency Fellowship with the Navarra Council for the Arts. For more, please visit Jacinta White. Dot com. And with that, I'll bring to the stage Jacinta White. So I'm acting like I'm walking up onto a stage. I like it. I like it. Very good. <laughs> you we said can't bring it to the stage, so I'm coming. <laughs> and I'll take my exit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew, for the invitation and Carolina Poets. It is an honor to be asked to share uh, my poetry and to share it with such an esteemed group of poets that I'm looking forward to hearing. So I'm gonna read tonight from Resurrecting the Bones, born from a journey through African-American churches and cemeteries in the rural South. And I'm gonna start with um, a longer piece than I normally would. It's titled Church Girls. And it's, uh, I try to mimic to a degree the poem or the essay by Jamaica Kincaid called Girl, if you're familiar, familiar with that. Um, this is a, that was the inspiration for this particular piece. Church Girl. Here's what you do. Sit up straight. Place your hands on your knees. Always look straight ahead. Don't turn around to see who's behind you. Stop, then go. Get the two quarters and peppermint from Mother Davis. She'll be waving for you like every Sunday. Say excuse me, though the, say excuse me to those you walk by, so they won't move. Say thank you to Mother Davis, loud and clear, so she can hear. Go back to your seat, say excuse me again, and pay attention. Pay attention to the preacher, pay attention to the prayer, pay attention to the scripture. Pay attention, girl. Don't pass notes. Don't draw pictures of houses you wish you lived in and certainly don't laugh. I don't care how funny you think the soloist sounds. 
when it's time for prayer and you go to kneel, make sure the hem of your dress isn't under your shoe. Just step on it when you get up. And others may find that funny, though trust me, you won't. Keep your eyes open when you pray, but never let anyone know I told you so. I'll tell you why later. And when you open the peppermint candy from Mother Davis, don't do it when it's quiet. Do it under a loud cough or a tambourine's thunder. When it's time to find the scripture, don't look around like you don't know where it is or that Jesus' words aren't in his red blood colored. When you stand to sing, sing loud. Let your light shine, girl, and stand up straight. Don't play with the ribbon on your dress. Don't play with your bow. Don't play with the lace on your socks. Leave the buckle on your shoes alone, girl. I looked over your twice and you're fine. Come back the same way. Pay all of your offering, don't chew gum, sit with your legs crossed, place your hands on your knees. Remember how I showed you. Otherwise, boys would think you're spread like a welcome mat and their mothers will wonder what I teach you. Put more grease on your arms and legs, girl. I can write my name on your skin like a chalkboard. Look like a lady girl, act like a lady girl. Leave your Shirley Temple curls alone, girl. Remember to keep your hands down, otherwise people might think you've caught the Holy Ghost. Keep them on your knees, keep your mouth with a smile, and no one will know what you think. You never want people to know what you're thinking. Just keep smiling, looking ahead. This is what polite little girls do. And if someone asks you where I am and how come I'm not there, don't tell them. Just keep smiling, just keep looking straight, Tell them a cricket lie. This is what polite little girls do. So if you uh, if you grew up in the South <laughs> and grew up going to church, maybe some of those lessons uh, are familiar to you. So this uh, next poem is earlier on in, in the book and somewhat sets the stage. I'll talk a little bit more about the journey in a second. Tending the past. I am accused of tending to the dead, of tracing empty picture frames. My long lace fingers before ascending prayers, though call them God, I do not. Meditatively, weep, from longing or misguided grief. I know them know how, but somehow this emptiness is familiar. I make love to loneliness. Wake feeling it reverberate between my flesh and bones. Hear it whisper me back to sleep where the dead call my name. They do not pray mercy for my soul or care about this imaginary life I've built where we eat breakfast in the kitchen nook. I told my mother as a child, I saw ghosts in the rain. I was sprinkled with holy water, baptized in fire. Learn to push secrets under tall land and in silence instead. So resurrecting the bones, uh, the poems in it mostly came from visits that I initially took with my uncle, one of my dad's brothers. Uh, my dad was a pastor of you know, several churches, two in my lifetime, uh, mostly in Charlotte. Then we moved to Detroit, Michigan. And my father passed when I was in my early 20s, um, suddenly. And years later, my uncle and I were talking and he mentions or suggests we should visit churches that your dad pastored before you were born, as well as my grandfather, who's also deceased. So I scribbled out the names of the churches that my uncle gave me, the cities, all of that, mostly in North Carolina. And we took the first Sunday of every month to go visit those uh, churches. And the first poem that I wrote was from the experience of the first church we visited. So I will read that poem now. 
and it's titled Church Mothers. Women in white dresses surround me after service like absent mothers longing for babies return to their breasts, rejoicing. Prayers for a daughter's return are answered while they wait in line to tell me they knew my folks and how they knew me, young, in pigtails and knee highs. They remind me when I was not yet full of the life I now hold behind my eyes, pain taking up space I thought no one could see. Women, gray curls spiraling from beneath their cloth hats, twist both my arms in theirs. Take her to the altar, one says to the other. I am caught up in their strength, speechless and well taught to not resist this kind of salvation. We fall to our knees, caught by a purple velvet cloud and wooden rails. Blood and water sprinkled on my forehead. Forgive, they firmly whisper, the breath on each of my cheeks. Say you, forgive. And so it was a journey. Uh, we would get in our car and, and go to these rural churches, dirt roads, you know, in the midst of trees and, and wild fields. And I grew up in the city, so that was a little new for me. And I noticed that with most of the churches, there were cemeteries next to them. And then I started being more curious uh, and the poems kept coming and thankfully due to a grant I was able to travel throughout the south and extend my research beyond churches that were familiar to my family and so that's where the collection uh, comes from let's see I will read okay I'll read this one. This is about a cemetery that's here in Winston-Salem. It's uh, near Old Salem. If you're familiar with Winston-Salem and have visited Old Salem, there are a number of cemeteries in that area. And this one is way in the back. You can easily miss it. And so I'll, I'll read that poem. And so there's not a title for the poem other than brackets. And then the subtitle is Second African-American Graveyard, East Salem Avenue and Cemetery Street, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. 50 tombstones, dusty white, a forgotten fog until we find our way. Near the train tracks, I was told, a bridge to follow. The sounds, the density of our past, drops of red blood dried in green grass. Southern dirt buries all alike, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. We stand Palm Sunday Plain. To get here, we walked past the all white church, letting out, no one made eye contact. 50 tombstones. Near the railroad tracks don't have names. My niece, Erin, is with me. She rubs the concrete stones with her fingers. We make up names of those missing and wonder if we are standing on unmarked bodies. If they wish we were barefoot so they could bless the bottoms of our souls. There is nothing there, just a blank slab to mark the life of a slave whose blood may live in ours and on this page. Okay, um, I need to drink a little bit of water. Okay, so this is this is another one. Uh, as a as an adult who grew up as a PK, a preacher's kid, <laughs> part of this part of this book also is me kind of processing and 
just finding my voice again as as a daughter of a prominent pastor from the south pastor of a you know in the black community black church um so this one is called 12 stones i spent sabbaths water baptizing head first rinsing the week's sin saying i believe coming up dreads drenched the gospel of nina simone from the bathroom's choir loft playing while praying generations will come bathe my back read my palms see the histories and the lines around my eyes smell the trials on my breath i spent years walking over graves bowing to read each stonewashed name i tucked inside my pocket 12 stones you ask when i return if bones can live listen on i uh i am terrible at multitasking so i see comments flash on the screen but i can't read them so i'm just taking it like as a good thing <laughs> So if you're always saying something other, <laughs> I keep going. It's because I can't really read them and read. Um, but I, I like seeing it flash on the screen. So I have a few more. I don't know what my time looks like. Okay, I think I have time for a few more. I think that'd be 20 minutes or close to it. Uh, this one is gumbo soil. Gumbo soil is great for growing cotton and blueberries and heirloom roses, but it is, it is better for burying the dead and stories and roots and family ties and nonsense and quarrels and letters and coins and cigarette butts and moonshine and past lives and past wives with boyfriends, and all things unspeakable, and guilt, and sin, and worn shoes, and costume jewelry, and faux fur, and fox identities, and hatchets, and all the harsh language ever spoken to you or against you, words that stink and slay and slash and fly out, all which cannot be unburied, deep memories, and gapped smiles and southern charm and lopsided history books and roots of willow trees still trying to speak if anyone will listen and letters and boxes under floorboards boards and bruised photos and the feet of your too late lover standing graveside tearful and empty-handed that that one makes me laugh i don't know if it makes you all laugh but <laughs> something about it that makes me laugh okay so i just have a note from andrew saying i'm good on time so i'm gonna squeeze in a i'm gonna squeeze an additional one uh i'm gonna do this when it's in quotation marks this is one that is probably better read on the page but it's one of my favorites so i want to share it with you tonight and it's titled confession It's 11.30 a.m., the Wednesday after Christmas. Or is it four years ago when I tell you I love you, though I cannot remember your name? You, who come to me when I sleep and tell me not to forget. Is it today or a dream a thousand years ago that I say I won't? Forget what you know already. Go to a city that changes everything. The sage on the corner of my dream whispers. Pinch me. I turn to the stranger next to me and now it's 4.30 a.m. And I'm walking among tombstones in Paris, searching for names of black poets who fought to find themselves here. Or is it 4.30 p.m.? Tell me about love. Tell me what time it is and I will tell you what life I'm living and with whom. 
After I climbed on the healer's table, I'm asked questions. What are you wearing? What is his name? I wonder why these details matter. I have forgotten. Some make them up. Say what comes first to mind. Pretend I am under hypnosis to conjure you, to feel your spirit move in my bones, to see any glimpse of you. Before you come again, I will make the bed. I wrote you a letter on Christmas Eve, confessing my disorder. Have you read it? I tucked it under the pillow on your side the night you came to kiss me, the night I felt you sewing up my chest. So I'm gonna read two more. One is a, a kind of, you know, it's a longer piece. So I'll, I'll read that one and close out. Hydrate. Okay, uh, this one is titled Body. Okay. Body. Sun scarred body coming from between your mother's legs. 60 extra bones scrape her full figured body. In this body, you are threatened by your threatening dark skin. I see your dark sky purple grapes massaged by drunkards who refuse to look at your body for what it is. Eat the white cracker, drink the purple wine. This is the body. They digest hums about being on knees, holding pages of rituals between shallow breaths. If only it were that easy. Shedding sin every hour, like shedding 600,000 skin particles. Count them, you. Can't you see them falling? The bodies, the black bodies, the black bodies of children, the black bodies of husbands, the black bodies of wives, the black bodies of prostitutes, the black bodies of pimps, the black bodies of preachers, the black bodies of poets, the black bodies of the unarmed and unnamed. Count the bodies and black body bags, and I will count the pages and bodies of works that talk about black body subjugation, about black women bodies sexualization, about black men bodies degradation. When I touch your black chest, to make sure your heart isn't still. Eventually you guide my fingers to read your nipples like braille. I think of the 100,000 miles of blood we traveled into these bodies. And I want to know what your body feels like. If it feels like my body. If it feels like you're running out of air. If you feel awkward in your body walking into a room because it's so much like your grandmother's body and your grandmother's body wasn't wanted by her newborns. Or if your body feels like a bullet target, pull your body close to mine every moment I can as if mine is a bulletproof body shield, giving warmth so you won't die in my arms or out there later. Have your body placed in a black body bag, and I get called to identify your body. Write your name on a tag with a black permanent marker before they give me what you wore against your body, against your black body, against your body. This is the body. This is the body. This is the body that was broken. Okay, the final poem. Uh, as Andrew mentioned in the, in the introduction, one of the awards that I received was a grant to do a residency um, in Texas, in Corsicana, Texas. And this poem came to me at the end of that residency, which was also pretty much the end of the, the poems 
for this book. I mean, I still had to edit it, but I was coming to the end of my journey. So it is titled Now. I am not in the grave taking dictation from ancestors who call me from sleep to bring them flowers, ends to secrets or cigarettes. I am not staring at the sun streaming through stained glass names of someone's grandparents long gone, past country fields and dirt roads I've traveled to come to an end. I am not listening to tambourines or testimonies about the good Lord. I am not dusting off hymnals or cardboard boxes holding my deceased dad's cologne or journals or hand-me-down hopes. I am not busy making gumbo of religion and sacrifices while friends sit in the other room talking about the dryness of their hair. I am not thinking of the hours it took to get the red clay out of mine or how the rue is not yet dark enough. I am not looking at midnight against my lover's skin, questioning where this will all lead. I am not wondering if he sees the tunnel of my thoughts as he travels the lines of my spine. I am sitting at a window overlooking the gas station that appeared in my dreams before I arrived, abandoned, except for those I meet at 3 a.m., buried in graves I visited midsummer. I bring them cigarettes and ends to secrets. They give me pieces of myself they took as ransom before I was born. I wake remembering why I am here, that beneath the bed where I stay is dirt. <laughs> Jay Senta, that was wonderful. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, you. Can you stick around if there are any questions at the end for a few minutes? Definitely. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We'll see you in a few minutes, okay? okay. So we're going to bring on our next reader, R. Flowers Rivera is a Mississippi native who now lives in McKinney, Texas. Her second collection of poetry, Heathen, was released in February 2015. It was selected as the winner of the 2015 Naomi Long Magic Poetry Award, as well as the 2016 Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters Poetry Award. Rivera's debut collection of poetry, Troubling Accents, what a great title, received a nomination from the Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters and was selected by the Texas Association of Authors as its 2014 Poetry Book of the Year. She has a PhD from Binghamton University, a Master of Arts from Hollins University, a Master of Science from Georgia State University, and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Georgia. Her most recent poems are from her unpublished collection titled Gaynet Undaunted, about the life of her maternal grandmother. Those poems have been featured in the Langston Hughes Review, Cut Bank Literary Journal, and All Accounts and Admixtures. So without further ado, I'll bring to the stage R. Flowers Rivera. Hello. I'm Raquel, and I just wanted to say thank you for having me. I am reading primarily from, only from Gaynet Undaunted. This is my third collection. I'm wrapping it up so I can go ahead and start sending it out. It's a bit hard to release. Um, however, the first poem is titled Scullery. And instead of starting with my grandmother, Gaynette's Cox Flowers Pew, I started with her mother, Janie. Scullery. And this is set in Grove Hill, Alabama. Scullery. And I simply walk out the back door, ignore the groaning of the cistern will, down the path bordered white 
with bloodroot and Solomon seal. Toward the kitchen, as I watch the blue-gray grain of my skirt sway wide like the Tom Bigby, I've inhaled March's resolve. I walk toward dusk and night's moon-haunted heat to look up at the coming dark. The trees, a game, I name them as I go. Duffy oak, slash pine, white cedar, fringe and beach. And I wave away the mosquito and clouds of gnats to meet the holdover supper smells of the cook stove. Mama, Papa say I get lost forever inside myself. Every chore takes too long. Janie, just do the dishes, come straight on back to the house. And that's what I tell myself I'm going to do. I've left most everything except the cast iron soaking in the wheeling steel. Then I hear the galloping a ways far off, then coming on and coming on. I keep sizzing the plates, first one, then another, and the next, and I walk out to see George. The damp horse, quiet breath, no words. I look up, meet his eyes. He offers his hand. I swing up and I'm gone. The second one, Jane died in childbirth. Um, she had seven children. And this is about that, about the aftermath. It's titled Ada, Ruth, Esther, Martha, and Electa. Five silent women dressed in white arrive, filed through the wooden unadorned door. Their eyes shift over and down, counting the seven stair step children. Their necks gliding right until their bodies are forced round to finish assessing the room. Then, as far as their eyes will allow, deciding what the next hours and days will require. These women merely look at the young wife who had had this passel of children. It was plain enough, one after the other, ages three to 12, right on down the line. These women of the Eastern Star split apart, two to minister the children, one to inspect and make all orderly as need be, two to clean the body laying on the cooling board. Her hair still in disarray, though neatly pinned. Her gown still a wrung cloth, stained red. The first matter to be dealt with was sending the older boys down the road for ice. One of the girl children asked what most of the others knew. What happened to my mama? Why those pennies on her eyes? One said, your mama is gone to heaven. Another said, don't tell that baby that. Oh honey, your mama, she dead. My grandmother raised four children single-handedly in Gulfport, Mississippi. And her first husband was Charles Flowers. And the four children, the oldest was Charles, then my aunt Dorothy, my mom, Anne, and my uncle Fred, all of which are dead except my mother. So this is a letter that was sent after Sonny Charles, the oldest, went to visit his father in Chicago. Letter sent, Chicago, Illinois, June, 1952. Dear Gay, 
I am writing you regarding the welfare of our oldest son, Sonny. I know I have been grossly neglectful due to my wanting to avoid unpleasant dealings with you, his mother. However, now that he is 12, together we must face what is becoming more and more apparent. One of the greatest evils of manhood I am not blaming you, for you have done everything you could to provide daily for their well-being. But it is evident after his trip here to visit me in Chicago that there is some brokenness within him, that he is not a man's man, that his ways are the ways of fairies. In all other ways, he is perfection, his above average intellect, his skills at oration, both practice and impromptu, his willingness to be responsible for all his siblings and ensure their security, their safety, and his obvious musical talent on the piano. And the fastidiousness with which he dresses, but you must recognize None of these things will be enough to save him, for he is a Negro and male and from Mississippi. There will be no refuge for a boy like him, even amongst our own people. I have been around unquiet men like him. His whole life will be hardship. Yes, this is a dark tunnel we must walk quietly, unlike some of our previous discussions. Yet, about this matter, I cannot bend. The roots have already taken hold and can be seen moment by moment in his gestures. We must be clear about the meaning. I know my words may sound harsh, but know that they are not directed at you. Keep my concerns between us, but I know what it means to work among men. I recognize the roots entwined in what I see. Allow him to come here and stay with me. Yours in confidence, Charles. Letter returned, Gulfport, Mississippi, June 1952, Charles, no, sincerely, Gaynette. Um, because I lived or grew up or my home place is the Mississippi Gulf Coast, um, we don't often deal with the beaches that needed to be integrated as well. So this poem is titled Wade in, 1960. The dishpan holds the midday dinner plates, melamine, cups, forks, and even though there's joy in the water, there's no joy as I wash away the muck. That's just the nature of day work, holding your tongue while knowing elsewhere all the fracas is already underway. And this time I can't help. My mind leaps about imagining cracked ribs as my wet hands plunge and scrub glass circles to images, to reflections, but only one-sided, separate, unequal. Whites like Governor Barnett and them Dixiecrats don't give a flip about what the DOJ says. That beach always has been, forever will be, private property, whites only. I caught the 25th to 13th Avenue bus transfer, arrived freshly starched on time. After all, me and my four children got to eat, and I'm no fan of beans. Dr. Mason, the one from Biloxi, not Dr. Dunn from Gulfport, is trapped at the shoal's edge. He lengthens his neck, asks the police, am I under arrest? 
no, not him, too much trouble. The other protesters have become acquainted to chains and bats, to tire irons, bricks and handcuffs. Dr. Mason absorbs the scene, sweet Lorraines use their body as shields. He takes his time, tends to all the wounds he can, at least the ones he can see, before taking yet another long, tense ride to the courthouse to have the citizens council proxy say, it most certainly has been a long day, Dr. Mason. We can't do no more this afternoon. Come back first thing tomorrow. We'll arrest you then. As my grandmother became older stories started pouring out that I was unaware of. Um, so this one, I had fun writing, but I was so shocked. It's called Lucid. We moved in the same circles, civil like right hand turns, singing hymns of distraction up and down all those slow pine highways between Harrison, Stone, Perry, Jasper, Jones, Newton counties. Something about the axle of his hips I liked about him. He had gone to college, all corn. Once he even came to Gulfport to see me, a him. Don't give me that look. I know what I'm saying. But you underestimate how vicious and narrow I kept my hemlines. I knew how to sashay across a room at precisely the right pace to leave a wake of men in reverie. Back then, Medgar knew the markers of a race woman when he saw one. And this'll be the last one. It's simply titled, Gulf of Mexico, 1969, after Hurricane Camille. Don't tell me about rapidly forming perfect storms, about a kiss that can transport you through the blandness of living. I am that with him, but I opened the egret feathers he brought as a gift. And I knew they required the wholesale destruction of the nest. I see now how my date's idea of beauty of perfection will require nothing less than my death. Only then he won't be satisfied because I won't be here to comfort him in his grief. Thank you. Wow, Raquel, thank you very much. Those were tremendously moving poems. Um, can you stick around if we have some questions at the end for a little q and I'll be here. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so I'll go ahead and introduce our last reader. Um, Mildred K. Beria is a writer from Uganda and assistant professor at UNCA or UNC Asheville, where she teaches creative writing and world literature. Her publications include three poetry books as well as prose. Poems are hybrids in Tin House, Poets.org, Poetry Quarterly, Asymptote, Asymptote Journal, Matters of Feminist Practice Anthology, Prairie Schooner, New Daughters of Africa International Anthology, Per Contra, and Northeast Review. Her nonfiction essay, Being Here in This Body, won the 2020 Linda Flowers Literary Award and is forthcoming in the North Carolina Literary Review. She received a PhD in English from the University of Denver, an MFA in creative writing from Syracuse University, 
and a Bachelor of Arts in Literature from Macarere University. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. She is a board member of the African Writers Trust and coordinates the poetry o reading events at Malaprop's Independent Bookstore Cafe here in Asheville. Please visit her blog, MildredBaria.com, and I'll share that in the links. So with that, I welcome Mildred. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a joy to be here. And thank you listeners out there for sparing time to join us in the making and reading of poetry. Uh, thank you so much, Andy, for your introduction and for really organizing all this. So the first group of poems I'll read is from the collection, These Pieces Belong. I will end with four pieces from the Animals of My Earth School Institute, which is the manuscript I'm currently working on. And in the first group of poems, origins, migrations, and liminal spaces are some of the themes I'm concerned with. So let's begin. Cast over. Hope absent from the door, the last point of departure, home to all they've known. The child is exchanged for a mirror, its mother, a bottle of rum, and the man, a gun. Atlantic sharks that wouldn't eat every day or even choose humans swallow samples. Test birds forever changed, millions of years reversed. They grow fat following ships. Bodies that cross and land meet a similar fate in trees attract buzzards and crows. But why do clear skies like St. Kitts bouncing off blue waters make me sick? Here, where we are, snow drips on a doorstep, falling like the saddest note carrying our tune. Going home. The sea is the eagle that carries them home, patting its wings and spreading the waters. Salt treats their wounds where ropes and shackles have etched marks. Water kisses the skin hunted and hated as bodies fly down, down in the gray vaults of history. Waves the texture of soft fabric covers them. At last, a cushion. Land opens beneath the sea and welcomes their spirits. They recognize home, Africa. Whiteness no longer haunts, dead and freed they are. But the living continue to reel in terror every time a new ship arrives, guns and rum, trinkets in exchange for Keith and Kin. First, they shoot the guardian angels so folks wouldn't notice the vultures preying on black faces. Father, and this poem is after Robert Hayden's Those Winter Sundays, which I think is one of the finest poems ever written. Forgive us, Father. The gourds you brought home for our protection shamed us. Our Catholic mother suggested we throw them into the river. You watched quietly and did not interfere as we carried away your treasures and betrayed our ancestry. How could you stand us in the business that was not ours? What did we know, Father? What did we know of your silent wisdom and the pain? we caused you. This is a persona poem addressed for Sandra. So it's titled, Not for Sandra Bland. Dear Sandra, I write with the ink of my blood so that you recognize my last note. I don't think you chose to die. We all think they fixed you. You loved life or 
I always said there was enough to kill us. Why do it yourself? And we both know that some who used SISO, super strong rope, excellent not holding ability failed. You succeeded with a trash bag. Tell me your secret. Remember when you put your hand on my chest, mine on your chest, your heart beating like a drum. Do you miss the sound? I've grown accustomed to being here, but not without you. I could tell you things that even in your afterlife would turn your hair gray. Your departure, for instance, the grief I felt compacted into one word I could not speak, asphyxiation. I held your body once more. I hold your body once more in these arms reserved for you. I wish I could hold you one more time in these arms you felt home. Insomnia. The moment I lie down, I wake up. Guilty until proven innocent. Mother and I take turns visiting. We keep his favorite brand of rice in the cabinet and eat it when it's about to expire, then buy more. Our breathing is steady through the years. When we finally get the call, we will assiduously walk to the back door and welcome my father in our arms. The diminishing years. My father's face lingers and swallows my childhood in a precious smile. Thoughtful kindnesses, the memories of diminishing years, gray and gold, a ride on his bicycle, permission to put on his boots, although they are too big for me to walk in. My father's voice whispers, this is how you roast squash. You wrap it in tin foil and bury it beneath hot ash. You go about your business and when you're done, retrieve the squash from the warm embers. And this, is how to iron a man's pants. He puts hot charcoal in the flat iron, presses, folds, unfolds. I am only seven, but I watch for hours, tasks I am sure to mess up as I grow. The gray and gold, gold and gray mud until all there is, is the grave. My father's face swallows my present. More alive in death, I remember him. In life, I do not forget him. He grows on me daily, perforates my skin with his presence so I can speak and answer that I am present to return to the love that never left heals the overstretched self. The space between is nothing, no space, a gap so artificial and yet real. To have imagined I had lost you is now inconceivable. And the last four poems I'll share with you tonight are from the Animals of My Earth School Institute. And maybe the title does say a lot about what they are about because they concern the animals we live with or the creatures that live around us. Factors. Lizards will on purpose sever their tails when in stressful or dangerous situations an act known as autotomy from the Greek auto, self, and tom, severing or self-amputation. 
Even after the tail is cast off, it goes on wriggling, hence distracting the lizard's attacker. The lizard can regenerate its tail in a few weeks. The new tail will contain cartilage rather than bone and very distinctly, not only in color, but in texture compared to its earlier appearance. In humans, change in skin pigment and texture are due to disease rather than protective behavior. I heard of a South African woman who was once white but turned black over time. It wasn't the reptile genes calling, but a condition known as hyperpigmentation. Her husband asked for a divorce and took off with their three children. The yoni mammals that come close to regeneration are the African spiny mice. Upon capture, they release their skin. Imagine a predator holding its prey only to realize seconds later that it has escaped, leaving only its skin. The mice regrow their skin, hair follicles, glands, fur, and cartilage with little or no scarring. Organic surgery at its finest. Empirical sources suggest that lizards whose tail is a major storage organ for accumulating reserves, we return to a discarded tail after the threat has passed and eat it to recover the supplies. This makes me think that when we discarded our tails as homo sapiens, we were supposed to swallow them in order to keep our reserves intact. We forgot a significant part of ritual and opened ourselves to disease, predators, and a weaker immune system. Strangely, while looking in the mirror, I notice some things have fallen off my body and I can't locate them on the floor. Others attach to me like textile fa fabrics in all the wrong places. They fracture my ego and I must find consolation that these zones of weakness make me softer. I want to know more about the Self-Amputation Act free will and all, but the English dictionary corrects the word to autonomy, self-rule, independence, freedom, sovereignty, which surprisingly concern the lizards when they are shedding tails, compelled by their strong desire to remain free, safe, uneaten, and trapped unconquerable and not subdued in accordance with their survival manual. My house. To weave risk and beauty in a fragile balance, my house firm and delicate as a spider's home. I wish for myself a house made of spidery webs, each thread mirroring a path I have taken and others I am yet to take, each spin leading to a room with many windows to see monarch butterflies and guest wings for my family and friends. I pray that my house will be open and airy, indestructible in its elegance and lightness. I do not wish for permanence, but what's durably suspended in eternal presence, the way pollen grasps bodies of strangers on their walks. The spider at work hangs precariously over a cliff, water trickling beneath as though unaware of the danger, perhaps even inspired by it, invisible, to travelers jumping over rocks on their way to the meadows. This is the second last I am reading. The meat-loving God. How is tending sheep preferred to tilling the land? The two young men were both farmers, wife ever one. 
We are warned not to compare apples with oranges, to enjoy our labors with a thankful heart. To you, O oh Lord, I bring my choicest fruit for blessing. Born in the ancient way, my labor in words, I offer to you, King of words. I, too, have avoided blood, except on a few pages. It smells horrible, attracts maggots. Others perform deeds, massacres, I dare not mention in your name. Back home, we worked the soils and kept flock. Our livestock ate what we did not use and grew fat on green grass, cabbage leaves, and carrots. The turnips were tasty, parsnips and potatoes too. For the animals to be worthy of slaughter, they must eat greens and fruit of the ground, while you and I are sovereign in our choices. Your image in me makes me pure. My intentions and commitments, the work of my hands, head, and heart. In the end, the jealous hand wields the knife and slices the throat. Anger management could have helped. You too, like Cain, raged and cast, stepped in and took on the infection. At what point did we turn you into our perceptions? All those animals murdered for you, Lambs and bulls ate vegetables and grains. Cain and Abel, your sacrifices too. You have trained us to judge harshly the quality of our smoked offerings. I have welcomed the fugitive nature of all life, lamb, deer, plants, humankind, everything, I hold dear. I am told the cockroaches will survive us all. I will now read my last poem. And again, thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you, Andy, for organizing all this. S is for serpent. In the warm spring of 2020, an eastern rat snake put up residence in the wall sheathing of my home. I just returned from Triple Falls hike in Dupont State Forest, one of the gorgeous waterfalls featured in The Last of the Mohicans movie. I slumped into a comfortable chair on my back porch, closed my eyes, and enjoyed the sun. I heard a sound like a soft pat on the door, but knowing that I was by myself, didn't care to look back. When I eventually opened my eyes, by my right side was the serpent coiled around the railings. I gasped, but quickly recovered when I sensed that the snake had all along been aware of my presence. I've known this type to avoid human contact. So what was it doing hanging near me like that? I read all I could find about it, symbol of creativity, fertility, healing and transmutation. Good to have around the home, keeps mice away. I baptized it, Missy, for her attitude. If I was sunbathing on the back porch, she'd come out of the wall and linger, forcing me to move to the front of the house. If I saw her on the porch before me, I would leave her alone. If there's one thing we both loved, it's the sun. Once Missy got hungry, she would head down to my garden. There she would catch voles, moles, unsuspecting birds, blue-tailed lizards, and mice. In the evenings between 6.30 to 6.35 p.m., she would return to her place in the wall. The clockwork precision of her timing astounded me. And for all I know, the serpent could have been male. I don't know how to identify snake gender. I just prefer to give it the female pronoun. Through summer, 
when the world was reeling from COVID-19, riots and a wave of black consciousness across the states, I stayed home with Missy and watched her grow longer and plumper, about 5.7 feet. The full length of her body glistened, she looked gorgeous. I sent my sister pictures via WhatsApp and received her text. The world has enough troubles. Why do you have to court more? It's not like I'd shacked up with a black mamba, but I understood her concern. A dear friend also asked if really I wasn't afraid of Missy. I'd been trying to make sense of police brutality and violence against black lives, but finding no, se no sense, of course. I took a deep breath and told my friend the truth. As a black woman, I was becoming increasingly afraid of white supremacists. Missy did not bother me, but white people's systemic racism, that was a whole new ball game for me. Serpents are one of this world's oldest creatures. I used to fear them, but now I know they aren't what keeps me awake at night. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Mildred. Really enjoyed that. I'm gonna bring all of our poets back. If you have any questions for our poets, please post them in the comments area on Facebook or YouTube and we'll see them there. Uh, I'm gonna post all of the links to our poets work as well. So please check out and support the art that moves you. So we do have a question uh, for Dr. Beria. Um, could you share how you work with science and language towards a poem? Is science for you here a search for metaphors and moving from science story into a poetic narrative? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great question. And feel free to call me Mildred, by the way. Um, I love scientific facts because I sometimes find that they are really stranger than fiction. And they are also, they give me humor. A lot of scientific facts are really, really funny. And when I read them, I try to imagine them in real life. And so that's how I get into, into the poetry. And I'll share one tonight. I hope it's okay. I hope they are not children listening, but if they are, that's okay. I recently read that uh, kangaroos have three vaginas and I was like, wow, okay, wh why three, you know, and where does one go and where are they located? So there's a poem about that. And that for me was like, this is awesome. I mean, we are so far behind in terms of the human race. We haven't caught up with what nature has actually demonstrated is possible whether you're looking at the animals or the plant kingdom. So I have a question for our poets, anybody that wants to jump in. Um, how has the pandemic impacted the themes of your work? So this series is called Poetry Goes Viral and we started it because we lost that experience of hearing poetry in a room and people who launched books didn't get to go on book tours. So. Um, so that's this very series exists because of the pandemic. So uh, I guess the question is, how has the pandemic impacted the themes of your work or are you writing about the same themes as you did prior? Oh, okay. I guess. Go ahead. Well, I'm not going to go ahead. Well, for me, it's been actually a delightful period other than my social anxiety because it gives me time to reflect. I've been able to go through old photo albums and old letters and going back and forth between family members and tracking down the details of what made my grandmother's life sustainable, how ordinary it was while also being extraordinary and doing the daily things such as darning a pillow or washing dishes. 
I've been able to connect with those small gestures that keep you tethered to the family and give you a time to meditate on the words you want and witnessing for another generation that's now gone while contemplating what are, when am I actually contributing to that? So. So um, how about you, uh, Jay, Jacinta? Um, has the pandemic changed anything for you? Yes, <laughs> it has. Um, prior to the pandemic, my thought was I'm going to study and focus more on cemeteries um, mm -hmm. and, and burials and mass burials and unmarked graves and just that's where I was going. And that passion is still there for me. But I've noticed, in all honesty, I have a hesitancy to, to go to cemeteries now because of the amount of, of deaths that we are experiencing um, and the change in terms of how we're grieving and the rituals and funerals because of the pandemic. Um, so I haven't yet put that on paper, like I haven't written about it, but I feel it coming up. So we'll see what the result of, result of that is. But I have noticed the pandemic has slowed me down from doing the research that I was thinking of doing because, you know, it's just a lot to comprehend when we think about death and burial today. So uh, Raquel, we have a question for you. Um, you said it was hard to let go of this particular connection, uh, excuse me, collection, which I guess is Gaynet und Undaunted. Why is it difficult to let go of this one? Because I get it right. Um, it's documenting my grandmother's life, um, her civil rights activism, her work with the Mennonites when they came down to Gulfport, getting all the factual information right, making sure there are no anachronisms going on when I reference um, products within the poems to ground them. So every time I think I'm done with the book, I remember another story or I listen to the recordings that I have, I conducted with my grandmother and it just feels like an overwhelming responsibility. Mm -hmm. And if once it's done, uh, I have to be able to live with it. And I want it to be, I want it to represent my family. And so my two sons who are now, now in college can have more of the history documented in one place. Yeah, the weight of that history, it's pretty uh, pretty substantial. So we do have a question for Jacinta, and that is, as a preacher's kid, what of your poetry derives from the language of preachers? I, you know, I, I don't know that I could, <laughs> that I could answer that, um, but I will say that I do, and this isn't necessarily because I'm a preacher's kid, but I do notice how I weave in scripture or, you know, themes, biblical themes. And my pieces, I do try to pay attention to cadence. Um, I think my, my father and, and my brother's a minister. I have, like, I come from a, a family of preachers. And so cadence is very important to me as well. Um, but that's a good question. I don't know. Maybe I should ask them, the preachers that I know in my family, and see what see what they say. I don't know that I'm conscious of it, but I, if I had to pull, that's what I would say. Okay. One more question. So I would ask each of the poets, what do you do for downtime when you're not writing? Downtime. Anybody can jump in. I sleep. Sleep? Hey, sleep is great. I love I love to take a, a nap. I love I because dreams are inspiring to me. So it's part trying to create and but rest is really 
when I can rest, I'm cutting my phone off and I'm, I'm done. That's my downtime. Mildred, how about you? I spend a lot of time in the woods. I, I love hiking and I used to run and then I stopped. But uh, during uh, the lockdown, I resumed running and now I do it every day. It gets me out of the house and also because I know we sit a lot. You know, I teach online and uh, and then I write online. I mean, on the in a chair on the table. So I find in a day I could easily spend eight hours sitting, which I think is not really good for the body. So knowing that I have the woods to get into and running, it helps me. And I realized that when I'm running, I resolve a lot of, of stories and, and poems. Some things really come to me, or if I am struggling with language or the way to end a piece, I will forget it and then start running and then something will come in and I'll know that when I get back home, I need to finish that. So strangely, you've asked what I do when I'm having downtime, which is not to think about writing. I don't really think about writing when I'm running because I'm watching where I'm putting my, my step. But what happens is that I get ideas to work on or how to finish pieces that are not yet complete when I get back home. Mm -hmm. Raquel, how about you? My downtime is primarily spent outside in the yard. Um, anything I can grow, how I can be inspired by birds or feeding the hummingbirds or seeing that a plant will thrive in one place but not another and seeing that as a larger figurative metaphor for all of us. Um, you just see the entire cycle of living. The other thing that I've become obsessed with, and I thank one of my sons for this, is going back to the habit of listening to albums from the beginning through the end, skipping no tracks, seeing how the tension and stress is constructed and remembering what an experience it was to have one solid body that can transport you to previous generations. I've truly enjoyed that experience. Yeah, we've lost that, right? These singles that we download and playlists. And, and yeah, I totally agree with that. That's a, a, a lost um, art form, if you will, for us to sit in, in, in a room and just listen to music and not do anything else. Don't pick up your phone. Don't. It's, it's hard to do. But um, yeah, this has been amazing. You guys were phenomenal. I really appreciated the work that you shared. Um, is there anything that, else that you'd like to share before we close out? We don't have any other questions, but you're, anybody, anybody can have the floor if they would like it. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Um, sometimes I know that we all withdraw within ourselves. So it feels good to be able to share and connect with other people. And even though I do, I'm not a lonely person, it's been nice. My, my people online, my folks, um, whether I've ever met them or not, just knowing that we're going through the same processes mm -hmm. and I'll, I appreciate them being there for me. And on that note, I'll add uh, to appreciate you, Andrew, for, for bringing us together because it's the first time that we're reading together. I haven't read with Jacinta or Rivera before, so it's been my pleasure. And, and also just knowing that there are people out there who are really curious and interested in poetry always makes me happy because I feel that poetry is able to communicate a lot and bring different groups together the way music really does too. And so not to lose that is a beautiful thing. And to have this series happening every now and again is beautiful. So thank you for your dedication and for loving poetry. I echo all of that. Thank you. It was a wonderful experience all the way around. It's an honor. Thank you. 
Yeah, and I, as I think each of you have uh, done lots of readings and some of you curate uh, series and so forth. And like I said, I knew it was going to be a magic night because I asked who I wanted my first choices and everybody said yes within like a few hours. I was like, yes, this is fantastic. <laughs> so I was really excited to have you all. So thank you all so much. I'm going to close this out, but I really appreciate your time tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So. Thank you so much for attending Poetry Goes Viral. This is a reading series hosted by the Carolina Poets Facebook page and YouTube channel. We host readings on the second and fourth Thursday of each month. If you have connection to the Carolinas or one of our neighbors, please reach out to us if you have an interest in reading. And please, please check out the links to the poets' work that we posted and support art that moves you. Um, we had some tremendous work tonight shared so please support the poets that that's really what this is about so in our in our series i want to thank kimberly sims gibbs who is our co-curator and uh and uh, we really appreciate it thank you very much and i'll sign off thank you <laughs>